Welcome to Drafting the Past, a podcast all about the craft of writing history. I am your host, Kate Carpenter, and this week I was thrilled to be joined by Dr. Lewis Moore. Lou is a sports historian and a professor of history at Grand Valley State University. He has published two books, We Will Win the Day, The Civil Rights Movement, The Black Athlete, and The Quest for Equality, and I Fight for a Living, Boxing and the Battle for Black Manhood, 1880 to 1915. He also writes essays for many outlets and along with fellow historian Derek White, hosts an excellent podcast called The Black Athlete. If that all wasn't enough, he has also produced two audio courses that you can find on Audible called African American Athletes Who Made History and A Pastime of Their Own, The Story of Negro League Baseball. We talk about all of that, what he's working on now, and why sports history comes with its own unexpected challenges. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Lou Moore. So this is going to be pretty embarrassing, uh, but maybe helpful for others. When I was in grad school, I was actually told uh, I couldn't write. And I actually had to take like some kind of extra undergrad or graduate writing class. I can't remember. Um, it didn't help because that's not, that wasn't my, my problem. But I, I think I still struggled with writing. I always had these great ideas. And because I do sports, there's, there's such rich resources and you're, you're doing a lot of storytelling. My thing was just trying to figure that out. And early on, when I got my job here at Grand Valley, I had reached out to an old colleague at UC Davis, Liz Covert. And, and so Liz is pretty big in the podcasting world herself and, and was doing stuff on writing. And I was like, hey, you know, let's talk about writing. What are you reading? You know, what works for you? And then she sent me a whole list of books and one of them writing well actually helped me out. I went to my used bookstore, bought, found a copy, bought it, read it a million times. And from then on out, I, I've been really, I don't say I'm a great writer, but I've always looked to improve and, and realize that I have to read other people's stuff. I have to read about writing and just read in general. And so that's, you know, that's what worked for me. The other thing is, is going back to my graduate days as a TA. I was a TA for, for Alan Taylor when I was at UC Davis. I believe now he's at, he's at Virginia. And he's probably one of the greatest writers ever as historians because he's so clear. And going back to look at my old TA stuff, I found his old writing prompts for students. And it was all about clarity and topic sentences and assertions. And so I figured at the very basic, I'm going to have this down, right? I'm going to write really good topic sentences and everything else will hopefully fall in place. And so my boxing book, people tell me I fight for a living. It's the, it's the boxing book that is really clear, right? You could read these topic sentences. And part of that is, is that. And then also understanding as a grad student, um, you can't read everything. Sorry to, to my to to my professors at UC Davis. <laughs> there was there were some books I didn't get through, but you can read the 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 introduction of a of a chapter and also topic sentences. If you get behind and if they're really good introductions and if they're really good topic sentences, then you can get through the book. And so that's kind of how I started to write. So that's the process. And then it's just about, you know, asking people who who I like, uh, who are good writers, whether they're journalists like, you know, Howard Bryant, who, who works for ESPN and writes a lot of sports stuff or historians like Amy Bass, who, who, who wrote a really good book on not only on, on civil rights of the black athlete, but has a really good book on on soccer. And uh, for, you know, pop history. And I was like, you know, how did you do this? What did you read? And she was like, it's writing craft or story craft or one of those ones. I was like, okay, let me get this. Um, and so that's it, right? Just listening to others and then really being honest with myself and telling myself that maybe necessarily something's not good, but it doesn't quite work, right? And, and so right now I'm in the process of writing another book. And what's been super helpful is just that honesty. And, and part of that honesty is, letting myself know I will edit this a lot. So you don't have to get it right uh, the first time or the second time. You just have to write. And so that's been really helpful. for me. Excellent. So let's dig into the details. So what, when and where do you like to do your writing? Oh, yes. This is my favorite part about the podcast. This is when I, when I listen. <laughs> I, I, I listen to this podcast when I work out at the gym. Uh, so it's, it's not high intensity, but I always love this part where people say where they write. And, and so there's, there's different places. Last semester's uh, fall 2022, I was on sabbatical. And so I was able to write at home. Uh, first time ever 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm at a small R2 school. Uh, we get sabbatical once every seven years. The first time I had sabbatical, we had two young kids in daycare and just had to take the kids out, right? Couldn't afford the thousand dollars a month. And so writing during when I was writing, um, I fight for a living and part of We Will Win Today is when they took naps. There'd be naps on the couch or in the rooms and I would be in, in the living room. Now I got my office in the basement, drop the kids off of school, come back home and write in the basement. And, and then also at the coffee shop. I have an older kid, freshman practices for sports, and they are two hours long and we are out of district. So about a good 20 minute drive. And I was like, I'm not driving home. So I would drop her off to practice and I would go to the local coffee shop. I have my iPad, I have Google Docs and get a coffee and just write. And I would say about, I have about 130,000 words this semester of writing. And I would say about 50,000 of those were written on Google Docs at, at a, at a uh, coffee shop, just just writing. Now, they're not good words at, at this moment, but they're words. And, and that's where I, I write Google Docs at a coffee shop or, or in my basement. Do you have sort of a routine for how you, how you organize things, how you put things together? Yeah. So much like everybody else, one, I Dropbox, I have a Dropbox. And, and the reason why I have Dropbox is because I have little kids and I'm not saying which one, my son, uh, years ago was messing around and knocked over one of my jump drives. I used to just save stuff on jump drives and it completely destroyed the jump drive. And I lost a ton of research that wasn't backed up and some writing. And I was like, oh gosh, like how, how am I going to move on? And someone's like, you should have a Dropbox. Like, What's a Dropbox? And I look into it. I was like, oh, okay. And, you know, and I realized your school will pay for that, right? It's part of, you know, we don't get a lot of money for research and, and development at my school, but it's enough to cover a Dropbox subscription. And so that's the first thing. And, but what that allows me to do is I have everything synced up. So it's synced up to my phone. It's synced up to my iPad. It's synced up to my computer. So at any time, I can look at my research. And so I, I do a lot of, and we'll, we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, but I do a lot of primary sources, a lot of newspapers, a lot of PDFs, and they're all on the Dropbox. And so I could be at my kid's parking lot, wait for them to get off school and, you know, with 15 minutes, uh, because you have to get there earlier or else, you know, you're going to be picking them up late. That's the way it works. Um, and I'll just sit there and I can read an, an article that I PDF, or I could be at my, my house or about to go to bed. It's like, you know what? I think I'm going to write in the morning. Let me read this article real quick, get up and read it again. And then write. So that's one. The other thing is I have Scrivener. Um, and that's really been helpful just to be able to click through, write stuff, move it around really quickly, keep everything there. And so for me, that's that's where I keep stuff. That's where I write stuff. But the problem with Scrivener is the editing's not really um, fun. Um, they they don't really have a good oh my god like word check and and, and spelling check and just kind of get grammar and stuff like that. So I realize I'll have to eventually pull it out on Word. Um, and sometimes I do change your words around without without you knowing. So you're like, I know I spelled this correctly. And then it'll just be all off and you have to go back through. But but Scrivener has been, oh, it's been a blessing just be able to see everything right there. And and because I do a, public, a lot of public facing writing and write in chunks of, you know, a thousand words, a lot of it is a thousand word pieces, right? Or maybe at the most 2000 words. So it's not hard to go back and, and go through it because I'm only looking at a thousand words uh, opposed to, oh gosh, here's 130,000 words on this one word doc. So that's really how I organize, how I move stuff around. And then again, with everything synced, it doesn't matter where I'm at. I could write at any time. This is really sort of getting into the nitty gritty, but how do you, how do you organize in that Dropbox? Do you have files? Do you tag things? Yeah. So I'm really, that's weird about organizing. So I, I, I do a lot of, again, a lot of newspapers. And so the key is for me is everybody. So I'm working on this book on black quarterback. So everybody, so there's, there's one big folder that says black quarterback book. Right. And then within that folder, every quarterback I'm writing about has their own folder. So nothing's mixed up. Um, so there's a, you know, Warren Moon, Doug Williams, Vince Evans, all those guys have their own folders. Um, where I drop and I save and drop. And so I'm doing stuff on microfilm. And luckily now we're able to PDF stuff and, and, and PDF pages, right? Whereas back when I was starting out, you had to have a quarter or you had to have really good handwriting. I'm saving stuff. Newspaper.com has just been really good. Whatever databases we have at my school, 
And so I'll save it. And then I save it by date. That's where I organize it. And so if it's 1975, it's 1975. It's the date. It's right there. Even though newspaper.com is really good about having the date on the PDF, I need it for being able to find stuff because I organize chronologically in, in my head. And so everything's dated, everything's in, in order. And then if it's really good, I'll say great <laughs> or something. So I know to come back to it. And then I go through and I take notes and I, I read it, read all of it, take really good notes, try to get the, the quotes correctly so I could just cut and paste when, when, I, when I'm typing. And that's what, what takes a lot of time because sometimes it's not you know just a simple key search on newspaper.com. Sometimes I'm doing all of the sports sections. So for my book on the civil rights and the black athletes, uh, We Will Win the Day, I have every sports section from the Louisiana Weekly, which is a black newspaper, from 1955 to 1968, like every sports section. And I go through and I have to read them and I have to take notes. Or for this book on the black quarterback, you know, I did the Los Angeles Herald and Examiner for the football season of 1976. And so from August to December, and it's a daily newspaper. And so, you know, going through and, and reading every, every sports section on the Rams and also USC football uh, takes a lot of time. And then you, you take those notes. And so I have tens of thousands of pages of notes. I think I have at least 15,000 words on on Vince Evans and another 15,000 on Doug Williams. And so that's how I organize. I have a decent memory where, where stuff is and like, oh yeah, he said this. But before I write, I go over those notes again. Or if I know I'm just going to write about something very specific, a game or a season, then I just, you know, I could just hyper-focus on 1976 from, you know, September to, to December. But that's, that's how everything's put in place. That's how everything's organized. I do the same thing with magazines. If I get something from document delivery at school, I, I organize it in a certain way based on the newspaper or, or the magazine. So being organized is key to writing because you got to know where things are at before you start going. So where in the research process do you start writing? Is it after you've done all the research or, or part way? Yeah. Uh, so for this one, I, I made up my mind. Oh, about two and a half years ago. Like I'm going to write this book on black quarterbacks. I don't know what it's going to be about specifically. I've talked to some folks, and but I'm going to write it. But I also knew that I had a sabbatical coming up. At the point I decided I had a sabbatical coming up in a year, but COVID hit and then it got pushed back a year. But that's cool because I'm, I'm a little bit more, I'm in my mid forties, but I'm a little bit more mature as a writer now and a thinker. And it's allowed me to write, I think, a better book getting pushed back, but I still had to do all my research. And I'll, I'll be clear, clarify that when I say all my research, enough where I felt good about writing. And so I would say coming into the project, I, I researched for about two years. That's like getting all the PDFs and, and, and the microfilms and going on eBay and, and buying magazines or just seeing what's out there and then talking to my library, seeing if I can just get a PDF of it. Some, some libraries actually bought all these sports, these random sport magazines, right? Not just the Sports Illustrated or Sport, but some like local Philadelphia magazine. I was like, yes. So that's part of it. It takes, you know, it takes a while. And it's actually fun going on eBay, especially uh, um, if you're not spending all your time like buying baseball cards and stuff. And then I, and then I started to write. And then I realized this past fall when I was writing, I didn't have everything. And that was okay because I had time, right? There was no rush. Um, and so part of it was like, you know what, I want to go on this whole different angle. Let me spend a few days getting everything I can and, and getting all these books so I can get it right. Or, you know, I might be writing a, a paragraph on, on a game or a season and think, you know what, I really need this. And that's the beauty of newspapers.com because I can generally find something yeah, I need within, you know, a couple minutes and then, you know, go, go down the rabbit hole of finding another article and another article. And then all of a sudden you have a couple of paragraphs that you just don't need, um, which is fine, though. I told myself and that's why this I wrote so much because I knew I was going to cut a lot, but I can't cut what I don't have. And so I tend to overwrite and then I'll, I'll, I'll correct myself. So you've mentioned now editing a couple of times, getting comfortable with the idea that you'll go you'll go back and work on it. What does the revision process look like for you? Pain. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> so 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 I've realized that you know it's key for all you writers out there, and and especially the students. I always tell my students to listen to this, but there's two things: there's writing and there's editing, right? And and once you realize they're two separate things, it'll free you up. 
in the writing process, but you still have to, you still have to edit. And then I realized moving forward, you know, this is my third book that there's crafting too, right? You, you really want to be able to put together a nice book, move chapters around, tell a, tell a really good story. So, you know, there's those three things, there's writing, there's editing, and there's crafting. And I'm in the editing stage. And like I said, I, I got everything I needed to, most of it, I, I think about 95% done of writing. I had to come back and, and finish a chapter at the end in, in May. But I wanted to write, and now it's editing. And editing, I could get it in where I could fit it in, right? Like, so earlier this morning, I, you know, I had a dentist appointment at 940. I was up. And so let me edit really quick for 40 minutes or 45 minutes, which I couldn't do if I was trying to write, right? Like, just write in a hurry with only 45 minutes time. And so I, I'm going to go over this manuscript at least three or four times, just editing it, just cleaning it up before I can even craft it and move it around. And so that's been the process this semester is that when I have a break, uh, when I'm not grading or, or, you know, doing a review for another journal that, you know, I sit down 20, 30 minutes and just do a section at a time. And that's, I think that's the beauty of Scrivener. I can see where I need to go. I just do a, a a small part of the chapter and that's where I'm at. And then around May, I'll start moving stuff around and, and I have an idea. I wrote in order pretty much. So I have an idea of where I want things to go, but there are a few chapters where it comes to the narrative and storytelling that I'm really going to, I'm, I'm looking forward to crafting it and making sure it, it works for me. Are there people you get feedback from at that point in the process? Yeah, so I have a, a partner, uh, Derek White, who's at who's at Kentucky. He's my part, podcasting partner, and we're pretty honest with each other. And he's re- he's got a really good eye, and so I'll send little chunks to him. I don't know if I've never sent like a whole chunk to anybody, but as long as I'm on the right path for like the small stuff, I feel pretty good about it. And and so I'll I'll send stuff to him, and then a lot of stuff is just you know if I'm doing public presentations, um, I've had an opportunity to do some talks with with this book um, a few times and just getting feedback from people, what they really like about it. And, and when they don't say anything, I know that that part probably wasn't good. And so I had to go back and clean it up. But just being able to talk about it online, uh, what people are really excited about when I mention something on Twitter, it's like, okay, let me make a note about that. They really want to know about this person. So that's really, that's helped too. Let's talk a little bit more about using newspapers as sources, because I know that in We Will Win the Day, you relied a lot on newspapers and especially the black press to talk about black athletes and get that perspective. And it sounds like the quarterback book also does that. What are some of the challenges of working with newspapers? Oh, yeah. So so there's the, the challenge of being a historian, right, which is you, you know, people sensationalize or change things around. Right. And so you can't just go. Everything they say might not be accurate. And so I tell people all the time, I'm, I'm a two newspaper guy. And that is, if you are in a city that has two newspapers, then I'm going to get both newspapers. And so, and, and I think that also separates me as like a writer, you know, versus someone who just uses, you know, some non-academic and not a shot at any non-academics, but they don't have the resources that we have, right? So they can get on newspaper.com and maybe just do LA Times. But if you know anything about newspapers, they're totally different, right? The writers are different. Their angles are different. What they're interested in is different. And so, you know, having the Herald Examiner and the LA Times to be able to look at the same subject really helps. Understanding how these newspapers work is is key. Uh, It's not only key for saving yourself time when you're going through them, right? You got to know the rhythm of, of a newspaper. It's, you know, when does that sports section come? Because if you don't know that rhythm, then you're going to be there forever. But also understanding what they're, you know, what they're trying to do with the, with the paper. And, and so writing about boxing in the 1880s and 1890s is really different than writing about the civil rights movement and sports in the 1960s. They're trying, the press is trying to do different things with, with these athletes, with these black athletes. And, and that's I, where I think being a historian helps, right? Understanding the timing, understanding just how the press saw, you know, for lack of a better term, the black body and, you know, race and, and the difference of Jim Crow in the 1880s and in the 1960s. And then, you know, as the expert, understanding that I'm the expert and being able to trust myself and, and my and my training that what I'm reading is is correct, right? This is truly how society felt about these black fighters. Um, and it's not just some one-off quote that seems good, but I have five different quotes that are just like this, and this is the one that I've used. And so 
you have to be able to to understand those things and then also understand the writers that you're working with. So when I was writing the book, we were with the day and I, you know, I use all the black press and some, some guys are very critical of the athletes. Some guys just want to use the athletes for, you know, proof of the civil rights movement. And, and so you have to understand who the writer is and really get to know that writer. And so there were some guys who are, are really um, trusted from newspapers and understanding that they give me a different perspective, but they'd also tell me the truth. Um, and so that that can only come with just being familiar with your sources. And so you have to, before you do this whole newspaper stuff, you you have to understand that. And then the other thing, and, the, and I tell people this, and people don't want to believe me, writing about sports is hard because every everybody knows about sports, right? In a way that people don't know about, and there's no knock if you study Maine, but in a way that people don't know about you know, some small county in Maine in, in the 1860s, whereas they know about these major sports figures, right? And if you don't mention a certain thing, they might say, oh, what about this? What about that? And so he's like, hey, I got I to gotta have all this information down. The other thing about writing about sports is that it's daily. It happens all the time. And if you're not careful when it comes to the editing process or the crafting process, you'll also get into that daily rhythm of just you know, spitting out what the newspaper said. And now you sound like a newspaper. Uh, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. Instead of being this historian and being able to tell this story, right? And that's the other part about sports. It's great because it is storytelling. It is entertaining. And the hardest thing I think we have, the hardest challenge we have as, in, as historians is to be entertaining like our subjects, right? When it comes to sports. And so that's where I'm at right now in the process. Like, okay. I can never be as great as Grant Lynn Rice, who's this great sports writer from the 1920s and 1930s. But I could try to tell a story just like him in, in you know, 21st century time, understanding what he doesn't understand and, and putting this uh, a story together that I like and, and hopefully uh, my readers will like too. So that's a super great transition to my next question, because in addition to your books, which are very accessible to audiences beyond historians, you also do all these other projects that are very public facing. You and Derek White have this great podcast, The Black Athlete, which I love. You also write a lot for a public audience from essays and, and podcasts. And we'll even talk later about your audio course. Why is that kind of work important to you? Yeah. Um, so I have a, a colleague, we'll say his name, um, but man, it must have been like 15 years ago we were, we were talking. I was young and and listening to him just rant about colleagues not doing <laughs> enough scholarship. And, and even though we're at an R2, so it sounds different now. Like when you're when you're first starting out, you think you're going to produce, produce, produce. And then you realize that it takes a lot of time like to, to write a book or to write an article. Um, but one of the things he would complain about and he would say, like, why would you be a historian if you're not going to share your work with other historians? Like, and since says, why can't we see what you've been working on? We need this. And And I realized that it's important for us historians to share our work with everybody, right? And so part of being online, being on social media when I first started out was just that. Now, now I know I, I tweet a lot about, about live games and stuff like that, but I used to treat a lot of primary sources and, and treat the public like a classroom. And so that's kind of how I approach things, but just through my mind and through my angle. And so it is very, the way I write is it's very primary source intense. It's also very like putting the past back into the present, as we say on our podcast, is how I, you know, how my students do their writing now. We do try to do a lot of public writing just because I think the public needs us as historians, right? They know there's basic his history they can get. They can go to Barnes and Noble or their local bookshop and get this kind of basic history. But for us historians to be able to tell a story, to make sense of things like right away, I think that's important. Now, I could do that through a sports and race context, whereas Maybe somebody else, like if we take East Palestine and, and that train derail, somebody else could get on and in a thousand words be very clear about deregulations and, and the railroad industry. And I think we need that, right? Now, I, I can't tell you if people's going to read it, like everybody's going to read it, especially the people who need to know. But I think, you know, we could do a better job of arming everybody uh, with our knowledge if we if we write, uh, do some public writing. And, and now the next phase is, you know, for a lot of people is doing it via TikTok. Um, and that's just a whole different way of doing things. I've tried it in the past and it's not bad. 
take some time to, to figure out, you know, play with the app a little bit and get your get the media set up right. But I think it's the same thing, right? As historians, I think we have an obligation to, to help teach the public um, about these things to make sense of the past. Do you find the writing process different when you're focused on kind of a more public audience? With the podcast, we don't write. We used to try to script it out. It just takes too, it just takes too much time. And we want to be able to use our minds right away and be there. But with doing the public writing, it's, it is because you're super conscious because it's, it's, it's right away, right? Whereas if I'm doing a, a journal article, which, which I, <laughs> uh, maybe some listeners will get upset at me, I just don't do anymore just because it takes so long. Like I'm not going to sit there and give somebody an, a, a year of my time for 30 pages and then to wait, wait, and wait where I could write right away, right? I have my contacts. I know who I can, if I wanted to write something right now, I can get it up by tomorrow morning. Now it's only a thousand words and maybe it doesn't count on my CV the same way, but I don't, I don't need that anymore. But you also know that people who follow you on, you know, social media, people, you know, will be reading it right away and they'll be judging you. And so it's really sharpened up my, my writing, trying to get the correct note, understanding the temperature of the room, understanding what people want to hear. They want you to be very direct. Uh, They don't want you to play around. And, and, and this is where like, you know, Training from Alan Taylor, when you talk about topic sentences and making assertions and, and supporting your evidence comes in. And that's how I try to write. I try to be entertaining. I try to, you know, play with words as much as I can, understanding that an editor will come through it and clean stuff up, but really trying to, to say what I need to say in a way that I don't come off as like uh, too academic. And there's nothing wrong with that, but just very, I write, I'm not, there's nothing outside of my title and the fact that, <laughs> you know, I, I have a, I only work Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you know we're off. You know, at the end of April, there's nothing really academic about me, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's just really trying to be the the man of the people, right? What also has helped me is is having a talk with Howard Bryant again. I've mentioned him before. He writes for ESPN. He's got really, some are really good award winning books. And one time he told me that like uh, he had read a piece of mine, like a short public piece. And he had told me that, you know, you know, you don't have to sell yourself anymore. Like people trust you. You're the expert. Right. And so I think what he was getting at, instead of telling me my piece wasn't good, but you spend too much trying to sell yourself, trying to sell yourself as a historian. Right. You just need to get in and out and and know that people read you because they trust who you are. And so that's part of the beauty for me about writing public writing is that I have put in a lot of work on, you know, people know me from social media as this kind of sports history person. So there is trust and, and I can write in a certain way and people are reading my work because they, they like my words and I don't have to go through and prove, you know, that I have this PhD to have all this training. I could just be me. And that, that's, that's, that's been really helpful and it freed me up. To learn more about how Lou connects with his audience on the page, I asked him to read an excerpt from a recent essay that he published on a website called First and Pen. Here's Dr. Lewis Moore reading from his essay titled Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Hurts Complete Eddie Robinson's Black Quarterback Vision. Okay, so before I start reading, I just want people to know this has been edited. It was it wasn't the original piece that I sent in, but you know, I trust the um, Yusuf, who, who's the editor and runs first in pen to, to really get me right. So it says, in the middle of the civil rights movement, Eddie Robinson set out to change professional football. He wanted to develop a professional black quarterback, one so good that the pros could not use one of their familiar and lazy excuses to deny him an opportunity. In the past, the pros claimed that the black quarterback couldn't lead They couldn't read defenses, learn a playbook, throw accurate passes, or communicate effectively with teammates. Why waste your time on developing a black quarterback that might not pan out, some asked, when you could play him right away at another position? Merit mattered, but a man's color counted more. For the black quarterback, there was a special equation. Quarterback plus black equaled cornerback. Robinson, however, remained unfettered. At Grambling, he modified his run-oriented offense to become more pro-oriented. He integrated long bombs and recruited quarterbacks that fit the mold of a pro quarterback. And to further eliminate doubt, Robinson told his guys not to run. 
That's why we have running backs, he'd tell his field generals. Over the years, Robinson produced great ones like James Harris, Matthew Reed, and Doug Williams. While Harris got his shot, Matthew Reed's 4 5 40 time had NFL teams trying to move him to tight end. Then came Doug Williams, the best of the bunch. Called the Rifleman, the Grambling Gunner, and the Bayou Bullet, Williams entered the NFL in 1978 as the best college quarterback ever. Doug Williams, Robinson said, walks to earth holding the distinction of having thrown more touchdowns in four years than any man in organized football. Like Patrick Mahomes, Williams could put the ball anywhere he wanted, yet doubt still lingered. Could he read the defenses? Could he throw with touch and accuracy? Could he lead? Would white fans embrace a black quarterback? Doug had all the pressures of being a trailblazing black quarterback while having to lead a Tampa franchise that went 2-26 and in their first two seasons. He did his best to dodge questions about race and symbolism. He was black, yes, but he played for the Buccaneers. Deep down inside his soul, however, he also knew that he played for black America. Yet despite the hate mail, the racist fandom, and the constant media critiques, Williams led the Bucs to the NFC Championship in just two years. Every time he stayed in the pocket, stared down the defense, and unleashed a bomb with his quick trigger, he opened the door just a little bit more for another black quarterback. In just his second season, he played in one of the most important games in league history. On September 30, 1979, his Buccaneers landed in Chicago to take on Vince Evans and the Chicago Bears. It was the first time two black quarterbacks started against each other in a regular season game. The media tried to downplay the significance of the moment. One writer stating, the most interesting thing about it is that nobody seems to care. But there was no denying that this game mattered. It mattered for young black quarterbacks. It mattered for the future of the league. So athletes like this one do such a good job of connecting sort of present day sports headlines with historical context. How do you come up with these and and what kind of material goes into writing an essay like this? Yeah, so it's two things. Sometimes people ask me like, and and Yusuf is pretty, so he's the guy who runs first and payment. So if you're writing about sports and you want to get something, contact me, I'll contact him. It's paid too, right? So that's always key, right? And, And that's probably the best thing about public writing is sometimes you do get paid, right? And when you're young or when you have young kids, that's diaper money. That's always... That's always how I looked at this, these extra gigs. So let me just say that first. Like it's it's diaper money, it's milk money. And now the kids are older. I'm like, yes, all right. <laughs> so, but but I want to be different. And, and and I don't want anybody out there and tons of people write about sports to be able to do the same things I can do. And that means, this is not me bragging, but this means that I have a lot of research already at hand. And so every time I write, you're going to get the historian in me. You're going to get the primary research. You're going to get quotes that you've never seen before. And that's what I always go for. And so I don't write until I have the right quote. So I have the right research done, even if it's a thousand words. And generally, most of my public writing is about a thousand words. I think that pace piece might have been uh, 1100, but that's all, I, that's all I got time for, right? But that's it, right? That's the process. Like, what can I say that's different? What can I show you that's different? And the way I do that is understanding that I have a database of things. Remember, I spent two years researching for We Will Win the Day. I spent years, more than that, researching for I Fire for a Living. I've done two years on this quarterback book and everything is PDF and everything is saved and I have a pretty good memory where things are. And so I could pull something out just like that and and write it. And if I can't, then I have newspaper.com. I have um, Newsbank, which you know is really good if you're if you are at a, a university, make sure you know <laughs> you find that database because they have some really good stuff that you can't get on newspaper.com. Um, and so I can look something up really quickly. And so whatever you read from me, you're going to have the history. And the beauty of it, and, and I have it, it's a kind of shameless brag here, but, but people read it. And so I don't know if you know that. So the NFL last year got sued uh, by Brian Flores, a, a black coach who, who was fired and then in the hiring process realized that there's some racism going on. In that lawsuit, they used one of my public pieces from uh, the African-American Intellectual Historical Society. And I thought this is the coolest thing in the world, right? Like 
somebody, I don't know, some lawyer or some, you know, somebody who works for the lawyer, some law firm, yeah, maybe some grad student or someone dug it up and just like, we're going to use part of this as the, as the history, right? And so part of me doing the history is understanding that it can be used in that way. And people really love history, right? And, and, and they love learning about these things. And so I always try to put something in there that the, my readers, my public readers will appreciate. I was actually just talking about you and your work uh, this past week, talking about with people about how how historians can reach more people, and and I felt like you were a great example in essays like this and the podcast too. I was saying, you know, it's it's so great because part of it is just like listening to sports talk radio in some ways, you know. But then there's also this like amazing context that you get to. Yeah, thank no, we appreciate it because that's what we tried to do, right? We try to, you know, what happens too, and we and we could talk. Uh, we use Zencaster. Um, and this feature of having the face to face has really helped us a lot because it's a lot different when you can't see each other versus when you can. And now we're just having a conversation. And so, you know, in the past, we've had to have like our, our FaceTime opened up or, and it like messed up, you know, messed up a lot of things. But now just, ha- you know, this feature, you know, helps a lot. And, but what we always want to do is, is be the experts, right? But do it in a casual way. And because we both have pretty good memory, we both know our stuff. And so being able to drop stuff right away, I think I think helps. I want to talk a little bit about writing voice here, too, because in addition to being just accessible, your voice in this piece and, and, and so many of your pieces is, I don't even know how to put it. I want to say lyrical. I want to say sort of like, <laughs> you know, there's a good, a great rhythm, I guess. And I'm wondering, is that something you think about while you write? Is it something you edit for or work on? Yeah, now I do. Um, now that I'm, I'm older and I've read more, and and I've tried, so I try to be more creative. And, and I'm not that creative, but I but I try. So even in that piece, right? Like, so I try to, you know, the Buccaneers are like <laughs> I have pirates, and so the way I try to have them roll into Chicago, or I have this line. And listeners, please give me feedback if this works. I'm talking about Warren Moon's. Also, nobody steal this, by the way. So I'm talking about Warren Moon when he's playing at the University of Washington, which is by Seattle, and their offensive line wasn't good. And I have this line in there that says their off- he had a leaky offensive line like an old Seattle roof, right? And and so I'm just trying to... Does that make sense? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Like live feedback. <laughs> so, so I'm just trying to play like leaky. That means, you know, it's Seattle roof. And I think I did something like that for like a dock in, in Tampa Bay or trying to write about James Harris throwing a hook pass, which is a pass pattern online, like a polymer knot, right? Tight, like a polymer knot. So just, you know, I have time. Like there's no rush in getting this book out, especially since a book on the black quarterback came out last year. Another one's coming out this year. What am I rushing for? And so I can play and I do think about it. And and I don't want people, oh gosh, this is going to sound weird. Um, So, and please keep that, oh gosh, in there. Um, So, you know, one of one person that's helped me out reading is reading a lot of Martin Luther King and the way he played with words and symbolism and just trying to go back and forth with things. Like I had never really studied writing and tried to be lyrical. And then, you know, when you teach, you know, you teach the civil rights class every other year or, you know, and so you read a lot of King, you're like, man, I know he didn't write his stuff, but whoever's writing it and plus him could really write. And I sometimes I try to be like that, just balance. Like, so if I say merit mattered, but colored mattered more, something like that. And then, then I give an equation, right? And so um, in that, even that sentence I read, I was talking about counting. And then I knew next up, I'd give that math equation that I stole from like 1971. <laughs> um, but still, just the way playing around with words. Um, the other thing that's helped me out is just realize that I'm not from the time these people were. So like, if I'm writing about like say when I was writing about boxing, you know, I don't know about black life, what it was like to be black in the 1890s or, or 1900s, but there are black writers out there. And so I tried to read those guys. And and whenever I got stuck and, and I fight for a living, I would just read Du Bois Souls of Black Folk over and over and, and pick a chapter and, and try to capture black life. Or there's this big chapter two. I don't I write the books. I don't really read them. Uh but at chapter two there's a scene where where Joe Gads is he becomes a light heavyweight or light lightweight champion of the world and he's from Baltimore and there's this huge celebration of of him it's like 1902 of Black Baltimore uh, of Joe Gads with all the you know 7000 black people out there and everyone's you know hooting and hollering they're drinking they're partying and it's it sounds familiar to 
when uh, Lacey Hughes is writing about Joe Lewis and New York in 1935. And so before I even wrote this, I read that piece over and over and over again, just to capture what it was like, what it must have been like to be back in Jim Crow and see this black hero, this boxer, and try to like kind of emulate that. And so that's helped a lot, just reading people from from their time and trying to capture black life where I, where I just can't, right? I just grew up differently at a different era in the 90s. And so I can't capture what it's like in any of these generations, but other writers have, and they've done a great job. It's a super helpful piece of advice. That's really great. I'm curious, you know, so it sounds like in many ways you write for the ear to some degree all of the time. Uh, but one of your recent projects is this audio course for Audible called African American Athletes Who Made History. What's the process like for writing that kind of material that's meant to be listened to? Yes, <laughs> it's fun. Uh, no, so there's actually two of them. I just, I just, I just finished one on Negro League Baseball and it just got published like a month ago. And I just got an email from somebody who, 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 um, who's reading it. And look, look, I haven't read this. I haven't read this. Uh, but let's see. Oh, someone's complaining about it. No, so I got to read. No, I'm just kidding. He says, I'm just kidding. He says, I'm enjoying your great courses entry covering black baseball. And then it's just a question about, you know, you know, what's going on, but it's the fact that, you know, they're nice and they're enjoying. That's all I got. He's wondering my difference between Biz McKay and and Josh Gibson, two black catchers. But but that's what I meant when when writing about sports, right? Like so if I wrote an audible about Maine in 1860, nobody's gonna come and ask me this very detailed question. And so I have to be prepared to have a conversation. So you have to be an expert about now Biz McKay and Josh Gibson. So but what's the writing uh writing like? First I'll say this, listeners, if the great courses or Wonder Room emails you and asks you to do a course, and you don't have another project and you're not like an R1 person, you need this, I need a book, 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 book. Say yes. The money is the best money you'll ever get, right? Like it is, it is. I, I'm not going to lie. It's really good money. Um, They pay well up front. And so, you know, when I finished the African-American athletes who made history, ooh, when that check hit, we, you know, we were able to go to Disneyland for like two days in California, right? And then, and then pay it off, right? And, so I'm not, when I get any royalties out of it, just I'll just be upfront about it. The royalty system is not that great, but up front you get paid. But you, you're right. You are writing for a public audience. You're writing for, you know, I would say primarily an older audience. And, you know, they're geared toward people who are, who are lifetime learners. And so it's, it's great courses slash Wonder Room now. I um, mean, so you're writing not necessarily in, in academic jargon that you would as a historian. So I don't have to use words like voyeur, voyeurism, you know, words I can't pronounce right right off the top. But yeah, you know, I can just talk about the audience watching, right? And 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 you're really trying to get colorful pieces. And and so for the Negro League piece, I, I read a lot of stuff on Negro League baseball. I had known stuff, but then I made sure I said, okay, let me get at least five books that cover the whole thing. And you know, the five different art you know writers and and the problem, the hard thing about this is that there isn't a lot of academics writing about this stuff. There are a few, but there's not a lot, right? And so it is, you know, the guy who really loves baseball, who's, you know, you know, maybe self-published or writing for some small press. So maybe it's not edited and maybe the fact checkers aren't there, right? And so, you know, you have to read five different things to make sure this information is correct. And then you have to go to your newspaper databases and make sure that that information is correct. But the other thing you realize is what the audience wants. They want stories. They want games. They want lively stuff. And part of the editing process is them telling you, hey, what about this game? Can you make this game more lively? And that's the other thing about sports. People, it's a weird thing that people, like I write about boxing, you know, the boxing book. They want to know about the match where I'm like, ah, that's not important. Let's just get all to the symbolism and stuff like that. They're like, no, what happened in these 61 rounds, right? And they want to know everything. And so that's the hard part about sports. And just balancing that out as someone who's like, I don't want to tell you what happened in the fourth inning. Like, I just want to move on to this kind of business side of this or this culture side of this. But you you do have to prepare for that. You have to think about that. The other thing is they're 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 written in four thousand word chunks, and so they they do that because you each lecture is about thirty minutes, and so they're really good at, at understanding that how people's pace that they read at and how long it comes out. But the key is that I don't know, listeners, you know, sometimes I have a little lisp. Um, sometimes my words are not clear. And so what I learned from the writing the first one and the second one 
is don't use big words. Don't use words that, that you think are going to trip you up because you will be in that booth <laughs> over and over trying to get the right word. I've been, you know, I write in small sentences because, you know, if you've read from the teleprompter, you got to keep going and then your mouth gets dry and then you got to break and it's like, and then you got to start over again. And so you want to uh, write that gives yourself an advantage knowing that you're going to have to read this out loud over and over again. And so that helps um, shorten things up. That helps, you know, kind of with clarity too. And then I also think it helps when it's time to write again, because now all of a sudden, you know, audience, you know, your audience a little bit better. You know, I've been writing again, like we said, during the public writing, but also writing an audible has taught me to really think about who's reading it and what, what they need to get out of what you're trying to say. And so just being clear, being concise, that's the key to those things. And it, it you know, it takes time. So the, the Negro League one was, is 12 lectures, 4,000 words each, right? And I did it from, I would say, August, last August to, to March. And then it's a whole five-day process of recording. Um, but there's also fact checkers, right? Because like, like, you know, I got this email. I'm pretty sure he's fact checking on me saying somebody's a better catcher than somebody. <laughs> um, and so you have to be prepared for that. Well, so as, as we in here, I want to talk a little bit about inspiration. So I'm, I'm wondering what the best writing advice is that you've ever gotten. Oh, man. Um, so <laughs> I would say Clarence Walker, who's my major professor, telling me I can't write and me having to realize it and just sit with that. And just, you know, part of it wasn't that I could. And we said this before that I couldn't write, but it's like I didn't think about writing. Right. And I think. You have to think about writing. The best advice I can give people is just to understand that there's a process. And, and we said it before, there's writing, there's editing. And when you're ready for it, there's crafting too. And I don't necessarily think that you have to be ready to craft a book, your first book or your second book. I think you have to be able to write that book and, and get it published so you can get tenure. <laughs> and that's the other bit, piece of advice. Look, if you're on the tenure track and you don't have tenure, you need to sit. And you think about what you need in writing, what they say scholarship wise to get tenure. And you need to do that first. And then all this other stuff can come. And, 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 and so, you know, getting on social media, writing these public pieces or whatever, it's a lot easier when you're free, when you understand that it doesn't matter if that counts or not, because I have tenure. I think a lot of people get tripped up on that because it is, you know, being on social media is enticing and it's fun. But, you know, having this, and academia can be awful at times, but look, getting that check every two weeks and then being done at the end of April and then deciding if I want to do summer school and that's an extra check is 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 worth it, right? Especially when you, you have kids, you have the summer off and, and you know, you could do these things and then you get to write what you, you love. And and so, um, again, that's, an, uh, that's another piece of it, but writing, there's writing, there's editing and there's crafting. And if you convince yourself of those things and you really put forth the time, then you'll be a better writer because then you can just write freely, right? And not have to worry about, oh, this, this sentence is terrible because it's going to be terrible the first time anyway. And, and so understanding that and then be able to come back and make it better really frees you up to get the words out that you need and, and just to you know think about it and write maybe sometimes more than you need because you'll always come through and cut it out. I know you've mentioned a couple names already in this conversation, but but who do you read? Who do you look to for inspiration? Oh, um, I read. So I like, like I said, like I like Howard Bryant. You know, I I read. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna butcher his name. His book's not around here. Um, gosh, I'm gonna get in trouble. But I, there's this poet Hanif, who's I love his writing, and and I'll butcher his last name, and now I'm in trouble. I need, to, you know, I'm really bad at pronouncing people's name, but I read, there's a poet that I read and, and he's really lyrical with his words. And I can never, I said, man, I wish I could write like that. And I can't, but I, I love sitting down and reading. I love, like everybody, I love James Baldwin. I love the boys. You know, like I said, I try to read whoever's writing at that time. And then I go old school. There's this magazine called Black Sports and it came out in the 70s. And they have really good writers. They're, they're really clear. And so, so far for this book, I've just read their writers. I'm like, you know, this worked for that time. Let me, let me try to emulate this. Other than that, I, I like when people, historians write short pieces. I always read them. I might not say anything 
you know, Kate Aguilar, who, who's, who does sports and she loves your show. So, you know, I'm going to mention her name because I think she was the one you got to have Lou Moore on. So shout out to Kate Aguilar, uh, who's, who's had two recent pieces in um, what made by history, the Washington post one on, on the black athlete. And they've been really good. So I'll give a, a special shout out to her, you know, editors or manuscript people go talk to Kate Aguilar, go look her up, uh, make sure that she can get a book contract and, and, and all that good stuff. You know, you mentioned it a little bit. You're working on that book about um, the black quarterback. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what, what you're working on now? Yes. So especially, especially acquisition. No, I don't want to, the acquisition editors or, you know, if you are an agent or anything like that, I'm a free agent. And, and so anyway, so, and also if you're an acquisition editor, you've always talked to me, already talked to me, I apologize. I'm just being me. <laughs> um, so, so it is a book. What I want to write was historical, like, uh, like a nonfiction narrative, right? On the first game between two starting black quarterbacks, Doug uh, Williams and Vince Evans, September 30th, 1979. I've gotten off a little bit off track, but it, but it's still good. It's really about a book about their lives, but also how hard it was to get to that point, not just for them, but for other black quarterbacks and, and the coaches that, that were part of it. Um, so for Doug Williams, it's Eddie Robinson, the legendary black coach, and, and Vince Evans, it's part telling the story of John McKay, uh, who also wound up being Doug Williams is pro coach. And so he's a white guy and, and, you know, how he felt about quarterbacks. And it's a book about the system of football and, and trying to, so it's part of me is learning about, you know, plays and systems and why wouldn't they think a black quarterback would fit into this and talking about race. And so it's been really fun researching and writing. And again, eBay has been just awesome because there are a lot of old magazines out there and people like are selling like, magazines for like seven bucks i'm like yes i got you know sometimes when i get paid i can't I'm tell my wife this but i get paid in in paypal <laughs> and, and i don't you know and now paypal becomes my play money my ebay money but then uh i also i do also get reimbursed for like the the scholarly stuff of buying cards and stuff and so that's the book it's it's really telling the story about these two these two black men their journey um doug williams grows, grows up in rural louisiana in a small town he says it's so small you can't hang out in the corner because there's only straight streets, right? It's one street running through. Whereas Evans grows up in Greensboro, the home of the civil rights movement, right? And and so they they're they're, they're just two different guys coming to the same point. They're different type of quarterbacks, and so it's been fun just telling that story and how we got there, and then talking about it. So that's that's where it's at. Again, there's a book that came out last year on the black quarterback. There's one issue on the black quarterback. I they don't do what I do just because of the timing and the access I have to. But the beauty of that is that I don't have to do that anymore. Right? When someone writes this complete book, a full book, you don't have you can narrow in on what you want to narrow in on. So I'm really free. Uh, the other thing I'll say is this. a lot of times people write and and, you know, the way it works, the manuscript process is that you approach the acquisition editor and say, hey, would you like this? And they say, yeah, send me a couple of chapters. And and I'm not doing that. I'm not worried about a contract. I'm just writing. I'm not going to let an editor shape my thoughts right now. I just want to see what I could do first. And it's, it, it catches people off surprise. Like, well, I wouldn't write without a contract. And I'm like, I don't, but I don't care. Like, I don't need it. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I have my books out. I have the audibles. I've done a lot of things. Like, I want to be able to write what I want to write without tell, someone telling me no right off the bat. Like, this doesn't work. Um, because I know that there's a million different publishers out there and somebody somebody will take it and and then together we'll 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 craft the rest of it together but i this is my baby this is my special project and so i'm approaching it from that now it might seem like kind of selfish it might be closed-minded but it's just what what i want to do at this point right where i'm not going to worry about someone telling me no before i i write it like i'm telling myself yes and i think that's been really empowering that sounds great i can't wait to read it already well, Professor Lou Moore, thank you so much for joining me on this uh, this episode of Drafting the Past. Thank you for having me. I've been waiting a whole year for this, so I hope I did disappoint. I think it was definitely worth the wait. Thanks again to Dr. Lewis Moore for taking the time to join me on Drafting the Past. And thanks to you for listening and supporting the show. You can find links to Dr. Moore's books, podcasts, the essays we talked about at draftingthepast.com. There, you can also learn a little bit more about how to financially support the show and help keep it going. 
Until next time, happy writing.